In processing wafers in the NanoFab lab, we need to make images into the wafer using a technique called photolithography. Photolithography provides the images of your circuit and on the substrate, so you can do post-processing to it, such as etch or metallization. In order to perform photolithography in the NanoFab, we need to first coat our substrates with photoresist. We do that using a Brewer Sciences C coater, which has an integrated coat, spin coat bowl, and hot plate. We first have to set up the process, the program in the C coder for the spin process. In this case, we're going to use a 3000 RPM at 30 second spin speed and spin time. The hot plate will be set up for 100 degrees C to cast the resist after the spin coating is done. And that 100 degree process is for 60 seconds. However, in order to make sure that we have a good adhesion between the resist and the substrate, we also need to use a primer. And the primer is called HMDS or hexamethyldesilazane. To set up the spinner, we put a, we put a spinner collection bowl into the uh, coating module. This is to collect the resist and to keep a solvent-rich environment for the wafer. And then we also set up the temperature preset for 100 degrees C for the bake process. We also set up a second hot plate for 110 degrees in order to bake the HMDS. Once the bowl is in place and the chuck is attached to the spindle on the, on the coater, we put a certain amount, a, a small amount of resist inside the bowl in order to create a solvent-rich environment. This helps the laminar flow of the resist coating so that we get a nice uniform film across the wafer. The first thing we'll do is we'll put the wafer on. We'll center the wafer on the chuck using the centering device. Check for centering. And then Kerry will go ahead and dispense the HMDS on the wafer, spinning it at 3000 RPM for 30 seconds. HMDS is a priming agent in order to help build a covalent bond between the wafer substrate and the resist. The molecule in HMDS is a trimethyl silo group, and it provides a silanol to bond to the oxide on the silicon wafer, a covalent bond, and it also provides methyl groups on the other side of the molecule to bond to the resist in a covalent bond. This provides a full covalent bond between the resist to the substrate, improving adhesion. When she spins it up, it spins a very thin layer. However, it's not a monolayer. After the spin coat is done, she'll bake it, and that bake process will evolve all the excess HMDS and just leave a monolayer. Once the spinning is done, she'll take the wafer and she'll bake it on the hot plate at 110 degrees for 60 seconds. Once the HMDS has been baked on the substrate surface, she can cool the wafer down and then reattach it to the chuck, recentering the wafer, and now apply the resist. She checks the centering and then she also deposits a nice large medallion of resist in the center of the wafer, closes the bowl, and allows it to spin up at the 3000 RPM for 30 seconds. It is important when dispensing the resist onto the substrate that you take care not to put any bubbles and to make sure that there's plenty of resist on the wafer. If there are any bubbles, it could cause cometary striations or variations in the resist thickness due to this bubble defect that it spins off during the spin process. If you don't put enough resist on, you'll have areas where resist does not cover the wafer. It'll be voids in the film that do not completely cover the wafer. The spin speed that we use to spin the resist depends upon a thing called a spin curve. Uh, the spin curve is a chart that is built um, showing the resist thickness versus spin speed. And this is typically performed with the resist in the lab in the, on the equipment that you're going to be using so that you have a consistent and accurate model of the resist thickness. Typically, five points on the spin curve are spun up at, say, 1,000 to 6,000 RPM. And then a curve is formed, and then you can interpolate between the points to find the exact resist thickness that you're looking for, and of course the spin speed to coat that film. Once the spin process is done, the wafer is removed and put on the hot plate to bake at 100 degrees for 60 seconds. 
Also, the coat bowl should be closed up between spin processes in order to make sure that the solvent-rich environment is maintained inside the bowl to provide a consistent coat film thickness wafer to wafer. Once the resist film is fully baked, you can take the wafer off the hot plate and look at the film, looking at the coloration across the wafer. Typically it will be a very uniform color across the wafer. Any imperfections will show up very well as cometary striations and, and those typically are caused by particles on the wafer. There may be a slight coloration difference between the center to edge, but typically uh, the coloration difference is less than 100 angstroms of film difference. Now we're ready for the actual exposure of the wafer. The exposure of the wafer will occur on an 808 OAI aligner. It is a aligner that can expose from pieces all the way up to 8 inch wafers. It's very versatile. It also has varying mass sizes it can use. Typically the mass size that we use though is a 5 inch mask. And in this case, we're using it on a four inch wafer. The first thing that has to be done is we have to take the mask holder off of the unit in order to attach the mask to the mask holder. We also have to ensure that the proper chuck is in place for the substrate and that it's attached properly and aligned properly. The mask is held by a spring release mechanism and also a uh, vacuum backside attachment. We have to make sure that the, it has a good vacuum on the mask so that the mask does not come off of the mask holder during the process. And we determine that by looking at the vacuum on the mask holder dial to make sure that it is a sufficient vacuum. When putting the mask on the mask holder, we have to make sure that the chrome side is up on the mask so that when we put the mask holder back onto the frame of the tool, that the chrome side is down towards the substrate. We want to have intimate contact between the resist coated side of the substrate to the actual chrome side of the mask so that we don't have any diffraction related problems from the mask. The four screws that hold the mask holder in place are screwed down and now we can go onto the substrate. Put the wafer on the substrate chuck and then turn the vacuum on and then again check to make sure that the vacuum is sufficient for the substrate. If it is not, we may end up with having the wafer stuck to the mask because the resist is not quite hard. It does have a softness to it and it can actually stick to the mask if it's not held down by vacuum to the substrate chuck. Next we push the substrate chuck in underneath the mask into the system and perform a calibration gap between the substrate and the mask. We have to know exactly at what point the wafer touches the mask so we know what the gap setting can be when we go into alignment gap. And then of course, if we go into one of the printing modes, which is proximity gap, hard contact, or soft contact. A feeler gauge is placed on the mask just to make sure that we understand exactly when the wafer makes contact with the mask by showing the deflection on the feeler gauge. Once that position is known, that becomes our zero point or our point of minimum gap. The carrier will run the substrate chuck up to the mask and very gently move it up and down until she sees a deflection in the mask on the feeler gauge. And that's when she will determine the zero point gap. Since this is not an alignment layer, we're just doing a single layer print. We don't have to worry about aligning the keys from the wafer to the mask. So all we have to do is make sure the gap is set, do a final check of the wafer positioning on the mask, and then print the wafer. Once the gap has been calibrated, you can move the substrate down into an alignment, <clears throat> an actual alignment gap, 
which is slightly larger than any printing any of the printing gaps. Do a final verification of the wafer to mask alignment visually. Select the printing gap that you want to use. Put the wafer in that printing gap. And hit expose. The exposure head comes across, goes over the mask and wafer, which is in contact to the mask, and then exposes for a predetermined amount of time, depending on the dosage requirement of the resist. Thick resists usually require a very long dose. Thinner resists usually require a very short dose. Once the exposure is done, the system will pull the substrate down into a larger gap from the mask so that we can pull the substrate holder out from in, in the tool. Once the printing is done, you can usually see the pattern in what they call a latent image on the wafer once you've done the printing, you don't even have to develop it, you can usually see the pattern. Now the wafer is ready for development. If the photolithography step requires mask to wafer alignment, uh, additional steps may need to be performed in order to get the mask aligned to the tool, to the objectives on the tool, and also to make sure that the wafer is aligned to the mask and that the patterns are properly aligned on the wafer. The first step is, is to align the mask to the objectives of the tool to make sure that the keys are in the field of view. Once that has been completed, the wafer can be brought up in, into the alignment gap for the mask and then both images can be seen, the mask and the wafer keys and then those can be aligned to each other. And once they're aligned, they are put in contact, final check, and then an exposure is done. Once the keys have been put into the field of view and they're ready for the alignment of the wafer, the wafer is brought up to the gap to the alignment gap. There are adjustments on the wafer stage, the actual wafer chuck, for X and Y and rotation. And then the wafer has to be moved around so that the keys can be aligned to the mask properly. Fine-tuning of the keys are done. Once that's been complete, wafer is brought into, up into contact for the exposure. A head comes across and again performs the predetermined dosage exposure of the resist. After the exposure, chuck moves down, you can pull the chuck assembly out, pull the wafer off, and it's ready for development. Developing the resist is done in a base hood because the developer is a mild base solution, usually TMAH, some surfactants in water.
It's usually a very low percentage, usually in the 2 to 2.5% 2 TMAH concentration. Because the TMAH is used in the developer, full PPE must be used because TMAH is a nerve degenerative agent. So anytime handling the fresh solution and or the waste, uh, full PPE must be used. The developer is dispensed into a beaker just enough to be able to immerse the wafer in with a reasonable amount of bulk material to, uh, to absorb the resist and not get oversaturated. The development time for this resist is 60 seconds. Once it's been developed, it's rinsed off in DI water and then blow dry. It's a good idea to use a timer when doing the development just to make sure that you get it accurate as far as the time in the developer. Mild agitation is always a good idea to make sure that the uh, developer is replenishing the wafer, the exposed wafer surface so you get a consistent development each time. And then typically you can just rinse the wafer under running DI water in the sink, followed up by the vegetable sprayer to do a final clean, and then a blow dry after that with nit nitrogen. When blow drying wafers, it's always good to do a center to edge spiraling motion in order to keep the, the solution being pushed off to the edge of the wafer. This reduces the amount of dried material that could actually occur in the patterned area of the, of the wafer. Once the wafer is completely blow dry, you can see the pattern in the resist very easily once the, the unexposed resist has been removed. Now it's time for inspection. For inspection, it's always good to have a good high resolution scope with very good image quality. Look for defects on the wafer, look for proper development of the, of the resist, sharp edges good corners, make sure that the pattern is the correct pattern that you really wanted to expose, and then look at any verniers or any way to determine how the alignment went when, if you're aligning the wafers to a previous layer. A final inspection technique would be to use a deck tack or profilometer to measure the resist thickness in the pattern areas to ensure that you understand exactly the resist thickness. It's important to know what the resist thickness is when you do things such as etches so you can determine how much resist loss you have during the etch process. Now the wafer is ready for post-processing.